And now I wanted to read these passages about Saul and Jonathan and David before reading the Hebrew passage uh, about the root of bitterness because the very thing Hebrews says watch out for is what Saul fell into. Saul fell into it. In our story, Saul has developed a root of bitterness. He's, he's developed a deep, bitter root against David. Now, we know when it began. It all began when they were coming back from a battle with the Philistines. David was in the army. Saul was king. And they were coming back from battling the Philistines. And the women decided to sing a top 40 hit song that was becoming popular in Israel. And it went like this. I don't know what the tune was, but here's, here's the words. Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Now, if you're David, you like that song. But if you're Saul, you don't like that song so much. Because after all, you're the king. What are they doing singing that about David? I'm the king. I'm the boss man. What are they doing singing that about David? That's not good. And Saul, then and there, was offended. The Bible says, then Saul, verse 8, was very angry. The saying displeased him. And he said, they've ascribed to David ten thousands. To me, they've ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So what's going on here? Immediately, he's jealous and threatened. He's jealous and threatened by the favor on somebody else's life. It says, so Saul eyed David from that day forward. Everything shifted right there. The trajectory of Saul's life shifted right there. David's life would be changed forever because of what happened right here. Because of what happened right here, David is, uh, I believe, under God's will, but nevertheless, because of what happened right here, he's going to be running from Saul, who's going to stalk him to kill him for 10 years. So here's a defining moment, a defining moment in, in the life of everybody involved because of an offense. Because of an offense. They say big doors swing on small hinges. You, you, you can have one little offense and a great big door of your future and all kinds of various and sundry events swing on that one hinge, the offense. Saul missed the moment right then and there that Hebrews says that God is going to give you grace. When, when you and I are offended, here's the promise. God gives grace right then and there for us to respond to the grace and forgive. What is grace? It is God giving you the power and the willingness to do his will. That's grace. And so God extends grace when you and I are offended to do what? To forgive and move on and not let it affect your life. He doesn't want the door of your future swinging on the hinge of that offense. So here's what Saul should have done, could have done, looking back, would have done. Under God's grace, he could have given the offense to God. He could have forgiven the women that sang the song. He said, oh, those silly women, they shouldn't have sang that. That wasn't cool, but that's not all that in a bag of chips. And trusted God with his future. Instead of being threatened by this young man, David, he could have trusted God with his future. Because the sovereignty of God is always ultimately in control of our future. I told somebody this week, I don't think you can go home to heaven until your time here and God's will for you is up. I believe until his will for you is up on earth, you, you and I are invincible. But Saul didn't do that. Saul did not respond to the grace of God. His initial resentment of David, before long at all, morphed into hatred. A, a, an offense untended, an offense left to fester, will only grow deeper and the emotions grow stronger. In, in the passages we read, Saul wants his son Jonathan to pick up his offense towards David. That's why he told him off. That's why he was furious. Don't you understand he's going to take the kingdom? <clears throat> Don't you understand he's going to get your job? Don't you understand he, he's going to usurp himself over my desire for you, Jonathan, which is to be king after me? Don't you know that he's going to bring it to an end? He's too popular. And, and what he really wanted Jonathan to do was pick up his offense, come over to his side and be against David like he was. That's what he wanted. Here was Saul's attitude. Here's the attitude of people that get offenses. And don't deal with them. If you love me as you should, you'd be against him or her like I am. It's sort of a form of emotional blackmail. If you really love me like you should, you come over to my side and be offended at them just like me. In other words, I want you to carry my offense with me. I want you to pick up the offense. I want you to be mad at him like me. I want you to reject him like I do. I want you to think badly of him like me. Come on, Jonathan. I'm your daddy. Come over to my side. So Jonathan here is placed in a terrible pressure cooker. I mean, he is up against the wall. It is between a rock and a heart place. He's, he's, his loyalty to his dad versus his loyalty to his very best friend. What do I do? What decision do I make? Do I join with dad, take up his offense and, do, and, and be loyal to him? Or do I stay loyal to David and refuse to pick up dad's offense and be against him just because my dad's against him? He is up against the wall. This is a pressure cooker. This is a huge test. And to his eternal credit, Jonathan refused to take up his father's offense. And the lineage of David, which brought forth Christ Jesus, was protected. Now, now, what we see in Hebrews 12, 14, and 15 is that Christians face the same test. We Christians face the same test. We're living in an offended world. Everybody's offended about something. I've never heard more violins playing in my life. Everybody's mad about something, offended about something, got a chip on their shoulder about something. So the rule of the day is, the golden rule is, don't offend anybody with anything. Don't say anything offensive. Don't do anything offensive. 
Because if you offend somebody, you have broken the cardinal rule of this culture. But the problem with that is the gospel is an offense. So if I preach the gospel, I'm going to offend somebody. So I got to be willing to offend. But our culture has, has put a premium on not offending people. And so therefore, everybody's offended. Do the least little thing and I'm offended. I'm playing a violin. Uh, I'm pouting. I'm blaming you for being mean, cruel, or some manner of phobe. So here's the thing. Will you forgive an offense as Saul should have? Or will you harbor it, which is a damaging decision? Because if you harbor it, let me tell you why it's damaging. When we refuse to forgive, the offense we have experienced has only one way to go. Okay? You got an offense in you now. Somebody said something, did something. You're hurt. You're mad. You can't believe it. And, and if you don't respond to the grace of God, and I don't respond to the grace of God right then and there and say, okay, Lord, I receive your power to forgive. Do they deserve it? Maybe not. Do I feel like forgiving? Almost never. I have never been overwhelmed with some huge emotion of wanting to forgive somebody that wronged me. No, it always comes out through clenched teeth. I for, 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 forgive them. But it's not a matter of emotion. Forgiveness is not an emotion. It's an act of obedience. See, but, but, but if I don't, if I don't deal with it, like Saul didn't deal with it, it's got only one way to go. Where it went with Saul. And that is a root of bitterness. A root of bitterness. He said, watch out if you're offended. Because if you don't deal with it, it's going to put down a root. Root of bitterness is a phrase that means an embittered, resentful spirit. Now you're walking around mad. You're simmering underneath. You're copping an attitude. The offense is defining your life. The decision to not forgive becomes like a poison plant uh, that puts down roots in the soil of your soul. Look at Saul. His life was destroyed because of it. Ruined. It puts down roots in the soil of your soul. It's a poison plant. Root of bitterness is a poison plant, like an ugly, poisonous weed. Once it puts roots down, then it's got only one way to go, and that's up. It springs up, the writer of Hebrews said. It springs up, which means it's the idea of a, 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 a seed under the ground. It begins to germinate. It puts down the roots, but then it breaks through the ground, and it comes up where everybody can see it. Hebrews says when the root bears fruit, it causes deep trouble, hurting many, collateral damage. And I'm going to show you how that happens in just a minute. See, here's the damage that it causes, because a bitter spirit wants company. Notice how Saul wanted people on his side. Saul began spewing out all kinds of terrible, false things about David from his bitter spirit. He starts spewing it everywhere he goes. As a matter of fact, instead of being about God's kingdom that he was king over, Saul now is all about his offense. His offense is defining his whole life. David is living rent-free in his head. 24-7. He's not about God's work anymore. He's not about God's kingdom anymore. He's not about declaring the reality of God to a pagan world anymore. No, Saul is all about his offense. It is consuming him, eating him alive, driving him, defining him. Now, I call an offense that becomes a bitter spirit getting spiritually skunked. How many of you have ever been skunked? Ever been sprayed? Anybody ever been sprayed with a skunk? I never have, thank you, Jesus, but I've been around somebody who was. And I'm going to tell you, you cannot get rid of that odor. You know, they say, take a bath in tomato paste and all this other stuff. I knew somebody that got sprayed in for weeks. Nobody wanted to be around them. He didn't have any good dates during that time. No, he smelled. And I knew he was there before I saw him. So here's the thing. When you and I get offended and don't deal with it, essentially we're getting spiritually skunked, meaning you've been sprayed with the stench of a festering offense. And when you and I walk in the room when we're offended, it won't be long at all before people smell it. Because it's wearing on your countenance. And before long, you're going to talk about it, but I'm going ahead of myself. See, so once you and I are sprayed with that stench of an offense, then it's going to go through three stages every time. I, I can tell you every time. There is not an exception. It's going to go through these three stages that I'm going to share with you every single time. This is the route it's going to go. First, you're nursing it. You're going to nurse it. Saul held on to the offense. He should have gotten rid of it quick. How quickly would you get rid of a rattlesnake in your living room? Most of you would freak completely out and you'd be rid of that thing as quick as humanly possible. We ought to look at an offense that way. Because that rattlesnake inside of you is going to bite if you don't get it out. But if you don't get it out, you're going to nurse it. And what I mean is you do everything but get rid of it. Uh, uh, you coddle it. You indulge it. You pamper it. You, you hold on to it. I'm so offended. I'm so hurt. I can't believe they this, that, or the other, or said this, that, and the other. And you hold on to it and you nurse it and pamper it. I knew I was not going to have people jumping up and shouting me down today. <laughs> now, now, again, at this early stage of the game, Saul could have gotten rid of it. The grace was there. He could have forgiven. He could have moved on and put his confidence in God over his future. But, but he, he held on to it. And, and according to Hebrews, when God extended that grace, he resisted it, so the root went down. And if we resist the grace of God to forgive initially, while we still can before it's even worse, um, it goes to the next stage, and that's rehearsing it. We nurse it, then we rehearse it. 
Rehearse it means you're, you're hitting the rewind button in the theater of your mind. And you're watching the offense, the context of it, the way it went down, what they did, what they said, how you felt, how dare they. You're hitting the rewind button. You're, you're on a rewind loop in your mind, constantly thinking back to how it happened, what they said, and you're replaying it over and over and over. You're rehearsing it. It's the drama going on in your mind nonstop. You wake up in the morning, rewind. Dee, 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 dee. You go to bed at night, rewind. Dee, 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 dee. Saul, the rewind button was going like this. How dare those women sing such a song? Don't they know I'm king? Don't they know who their king is? How dare they sing? Who wrote that thing? He's replaying, watching them and hearing them sing that song. And the offense is festering. As he nursed it and rehearsed it, bitter roots began growing down into his soul. Are you with me? The constant rehearsal of an offense is like water on that poisonous seed. It's what it needs to put down roots and grow. The, the, the rehearsing of it. Rehearse, 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 rehearse. You're stuck in the event. You're living in the rearview mirror. You're not looking through the windshield that is bigger than the rearview mirror for a reason. We're supposed to be moving into our future, not living in the past. But, but if you don't forgive, you're stuck in the past. You are like Lot's wife. You are frozen in time. So am I. If I don't let go of an offense, I'm stuck in time. I've talked to people who, who 20 years before, 30 years before were offended and they still live in that moment. What a, what a shame, stealing the best years of your life by an offense. Can I tell you something about the people that offended you? They don't care. You think they're caring? You say, I am going to be offended and stay offended to get back at them. They don't care. Most of the time, that's like, that's like you drinking poison thinking it's going to kill them. <laughs> David is now, as I already said, living rent-free. In Saul's head, Saul's, all he can think about is David going after him, finding him, killing him, removing him. He's now driven. He's offense driven instead of gospel driven or God driven or kingdom of God driven. He's not driven by any of those things. He's offense driven. Once you've nursed it and rehearsed it, you'll invariably disperse it. You will disperse it. You will. The bitter person carrying an offense will always seek to gather others on their side. This is life. This is human nature. It's never going to change until Christ comes back. If we nurse it and rehearse it, we're eventually going to disperse it because a, a, a bitter Grudge holding spirit never wants to walk that out alone. They want others coming to their side and sharing the offense and agreeing with the offense and agreeing to dislike and be against the person they're offended with like they are. Amen. That's human nature. Remember that skunk? It's like being skunked. Uh, the bitter person will always, just like Saul did, want others to come to their side and be skunked with them. They want others to turn on the object of their offense like they have. So they spew the offense to whoever will listen. And unfortunately, in any time in history, people are always willing to listen. Saul dispersed his offense to Jonathan and ultimately to the, the entire kingdom. He dispersed it to Jonathan. He said, let me tell you what he did. Let me tell you why you're in danger. Let me tell you why you should not like him. And you ought to want him dead and be against him like me. He dispersed it. When Michal, his own daughter, saved David's life by helping him escape from Saul, he said to her, why have you deceived me like this so that he has escaped? In other words, how are you not on my side? He even blamed his own men, playing the sympathy card with his own army. He said, there's, one, there's not one of you who is sorry for me. Do you hear the violin? There's not one of you that's sorry for me. He's so full of self-pity. Or reveal to me that my son Jonathan has stirred up my servant against me. He said, translated, how can you say you care about me and not take up my offense against David? He said to his own army, you ought to be on my side. And he's dispersing it everywhere he goes. Everywhere he goes. It's David's terrible. David's this. David's that. And that's what offended people do. They begin defining friendship and they define loyalty by whether or not you will carry their offense and go over to their side. It's no longer about we're friends in Christ. We've got a friendship that is in the Lord. But no, now I'm defining friendship by whether or not you carry my offense. You're either with me or against me. And it becomes we against them. Everything now revolves around not the kingdom of God, not the will of God, but the offense that we're carrying. Amen. amen. Is this true or not? So give me an amen or an oh me. I brought something with me. <laughs> Meet Pepe Le Pew. Okay, so here's a skunk. Now, let me ask you a question. If I walked up to you carrying a skunk, a fully loaded, able to spray skunk, and I said, would you hold this skunk for me? I'm coming down to Dwayne. Would you hold that skunk for me? If you have a brain in your head, because he's any time gonna turn, and it's going to be bad. But would you, would you, I got to go somewhere. Can you hold this fully sprayable, fully loaded skunk? Would you? No. Pretend that you're going to. <laughs> let, me, let me show you how it happens. Dwayne, have you heard what so-and-so did and what they said and how they hurt so-and-so? And it was so wrong, Dwayne. And, and, and uh, 
wow, they're just, they were so terrible to do such a thing. And I name names and I target somebody and I give you a report like that and you take it, take it, take it. <laughs> he doesn't want to take it. It's fake and he doesn't want to take it. Hang on. Now, now you've taken it. Now I already smelled because I'm carrying the skunk of defense, but now you've got the same scent and you're sitting in church. And you know what you're sitting in church doing? Holding a skunk. You're sitting in church holding an offense. You're, you're, you're walking around with an offense. There you go. No, no. Okay, so here's the way it works. Once you have done that, you're going to tell someone else about the offense. So turn around and just mutter something. Just say it to them. Okay, no. Okay. Now, now they, 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 they said, really? That happened? That was said? Now they've got the skunk. Here, I'm giving you another one, Dwayne. Now, now it's starting to spread. So here comes another one. Pick it up. Okay, now, now there she is. Now here we go. Oh, I'm sorry, I hit that man in the head. I gotta be careful. You're not offended, are you? <laughs> okay, here you go. Okay, now look, what, what's going, I can't get way back there, I wish I could. There you go. Now what's happening? The offense, come on, what's happening? Oh, there's a big skunk. Some of them are smaller, some are bigger. Here we go. Okay, now, now what's happening? The offense is doing what? Where? In church. Can you believe, grab that skunk? Come on, you gotta pick it up. Okay, here, here, here we go. Now I'm gonna keep on doing this. I've got a bunch of them with me. Somebody pick that skunk up. Would you please pick up my offense? Would you please pick up that offense? Okay, he, he picked it up. Now, by the way, just so you'll know, don't go home with my skunks. I need them for the second service. <laughs> so here we go. There's one. Okay, so, so, so I'm gonna do one more. Here we go. What's going on here? What's going on? Tell me what's going on. The offense is spreading. Okay, way out there. Okay, now I want everybody with a skunk to stand up. Everybody with a skunk to stand up. Oh, and that got a skunk. All right, now watch this. Don't, don't sit down, stand up, wave that skunk. Okay, now I want you to notice. Now, let me ask you a question. As the offense spreads and people listen and they pick up the offense, what does that do to the spirit of God in that church? Grieved. What, how powerful is the testimony of that church of a forgiving God if they're holding this? Hold them up and wave them. And see, they walk in and we immediately can see the skunk. Where is the skunk? How can you see the skunk? I, I'm gonna tell you how you can see it. It changes your countenance. You used to walk in full of joy and sit on the front row. Now, nothing against people in the back row, just hang with me. This is only an illustration. But when the, they get skunked, they start moving back until finally they disappear. What happened to so-and-so? And then you find out, they got skunked. And that's what's happened. So, so now, here's what you have. A church divided. You have people with him or against him, picking up the offense or rejecting it. So now you have sides. Getting skunked like this as it travels through a church or a business or a family. It chases the anointing of God away. Because now you're not about the kingdom anymore. You're about the offense. It steals your peace, steals your joy. And that offense begins to be the chiseling factor of your life instead of the word of God and the spirit of God. Because now the offense is shaping you. You're walking in with a sour face. You're walking in mad. You're walking in judging everything. You're walking in having believed. Now, now listen, let me just close. Let me, I'm coming to the close, so stay with me, all of you skunk people. Stay with me. <laughs> stay with me. Uh, the Bible says, anytime there is a report about somebody, you should always get the other side. Here, here, here's the verse, Proverbs 18, 13. He who answers a matter before he gets both sides, it's a shame and a folly to him. So you hear a report and say, give me that skunk. I'll carry that offense with you. I'm skunked. But you never got the other side because there's always another side. Amen. Let me tell you about offense. Hold the skunk up again. Let me tell you, when you get skunked like this, offense is a weapon, weapon of Satan. It is a satanic weapon. I believe it's his most effective weapon against the church. That's why it's a damaging decision because look how it's a damaging decision. It spreads. There's collateral damage. The very word offense from the Greek, you can sit down, all of you skunk people. Thank you. Now watch this. The very word offense from the Greek means trap. It's a trap. And you can, you can spread an offense with a look, with an expression, with a roll of your eyes. Some people are very skilled at spreading offenses. And they do it in a way that you can't blame them for doing it because after all, don't you know they're Christian? So they'll call with prayer requests. Uh, hey, this is me. I need you to pray about something. So-and-so said this, did that, on and on. So would you please pray about it with me? And what they have successfully done is spread the offense under the guise of prayer. 
Now, let me give you some takeaway truths. One, taking up an offense does not prove friendship or love. Can I say that again? Taking up offense, like Saul did, uh, and wanting Jonathan to come with him in it, that wasn't love. That was selfish. Because Jonathan loved David. They were friends. It was selfish. But taking up an offense does not prove friendship. In fact, the highest love is to encourage the offended person to get it right and forgive. You don't solve anything by taking up somebody's offense. You, you only make it worse. Jesus said, if your brother offends you, you go to him between you and him alone. Not after 30 phone calls. Not after spreading and skunking a bunch of people in the business or in the church or in the family. No, you do it. You go between you and him alone. The offender and you alone. Third, taking up somebody's offense is to join hands with Satan, who is called the accuser of the brethren. He's the accuser. That's his forte. That's his stock and trade, accuses. So I'm going to ask us to do something. You say, well, then what do I do, Pastor Jeff? Here's what you do. Put the skunk down. I want everybody with a skunk to come and just put it in the altar. Would you do that? Just come down and just put it in the altar. Just put it right here. Put it in the altar. Here's what ought to happen. Boy, Dwayne had two of them. Dwayne, what does that tell him? <laughs> now, that's the only good place for a skunk, in the altar of God. Amen? Come on, everybody. Oh, there's a lady back there hanging on to that skunk. You need to get rid of that skunk. No, I'm kidding. And then you pray that the offense is healed, not spread. Can we stand together today?